Good evening, good evening, good evening. Uh, so thankful to see uh, all of you in the building and then all those who are joining us uh, online for tonight's uh, special town hall dealing specifically with the subject of insurance, especially the subject of automobile uh, insurance. There are a whole lot of changes that have occurred in the state of Florida, and we thought uh, that it would be very important for you to be uh, made aware of those changes firsthand. Uh, let's do this. Before we get started, would you help me welcome all those who are joining us online, those on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. And then we are honored to have Mr. Nick Zisimopoulos, longtime friend uh, of the Faith Church, and uh, we are honored to have him. Uh, he uh, is a partner of the Glassman Zisimopoulos Law Firm, and we're honored to have them uh, to partner with us for this event. So a lot of great information we're going uh, to hear and learn tonight. Let me say to all those who are online, uh, if you will submit your questions online on the Faith Church Life page, and I know some of you are on the Kevin Thorpe page, please uh, make certain that if you have a question that you post it on the Faith Church Life page, uh, and we'll answer that question uh, in real time. Uh, also, for those in the building, uh, you will be able to ask your questions as well. Uh, just ask one thing. Before you begin to ask your question, uh, raise your hand so that we can bring the microphone to you so the folks at home will be able to hear what your question is uh, because many of them may have the exact same question. We're going to pray and then we'll get started tonight. Lord, we're thankful for this day, for all that it means. Thank you for this period of learning. Uh, help us to take the information that we gather tonight and apply it to our lives directly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Uh, right before I turn it over uh, to Mr. Nick, let me mention this. One of the last times that they were with us dealing specifically with the subject of automobile insurance, I believe you ought to practice what you preach. And I left uh, the service that night, went home, checked all of my policies to make certain that whatever they said I needed, that I had it. Uh, Maybe a year later, I was sitting at a red light in Jacksonville, minding my own business, taking care of my mama in Jesus' name, and looked in my rearview mirror and saw headlights fast approaching. I braced myself for impact because there was traffic in front of me, uh, and you know, nowhere that I could go, I was stuck. And that lady plowed into the back of me uh, and, worried, and didn't have a tap of insurance to cover anything that would have happened to me. But thanks be unto God uh, that uh, I was able to follow wisdom, have everything that I needed in place, and everything was taken care of. So please pay attention tonight. Any good questions you have, make certain that you share them. Looking forward to an awesome time. Would you help me welcome Mr. Nick Zisimopoulos of the Glassman Zisimopoulos Law Firm. Thank you, Pastor Thorpe. Absolutely. You, you can tell that we've been friends for a good little bit because you said my name perfectly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's <laughs> imperative. And I, I, I uh, admire and appreciate that. And I am so grateful to be here and be in your, uh, the home with you and your congregation, uh, both present here and online. Um, and this is really wonderful to be here. I do hope you have questions. If you do, please, let's make this more of a conversation than just me up here talking. It'll be much more fun for all of us if, we, if it's a conversation. Because I know what you're thinking then. Uh, and I will say, uh, Pastor Thorpe can check me on this. I am a subscriber to the Faith YouTube station. And I, I do enjoy watching uh, those videos. And so, you know, they used to say if you're on TV, your kids would think you're cool. But when they get to see me on a YouTube uh, thing... <laughs> I got two eight-year-old boys. They're going to think I'm the coolest. So I can't wait to show them that tomorrow morning. And they're going to be like, how did you get on there? So, so thank you for that, Pastor Thorpe. We're going to do, um, it's our hope uh, to be, we've been asked to, to prepare some, uh, for some of these town halls that will happen over the course of the, of the summer. And so for this one, what we thought we would start with is a discussion about auto insurance, 
different type of auto insurance. And really, if you leave here with nothing else, I want to make sure, and I'm going to get to this, but I want to start with it because it's the most important thing, that you have a product called uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage. So uh, everyone out there l listening at, on the YouTube station, everyone in here, the thing I'd like you to go home and check, do you have uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage? And the thing I'll always offer, you know, we are so blessed to have uh, a net that is part of our work family. And um, if you're not sure and you'd like me to look at it, I don't sell insurance. I won't be selling you anything. I'd be more than happy to get in touch with Miss Annette and get, and get in touch with me. I won't charge you a penny. I'll look at it and I'll tell you, you have it, you don't have it, you have enough, you don't have enough. Because I can help foresee if you're in a wreck, what kind of insurance will you need to make sure you can pay your bills, you can pay your medical bills. If you're out of work, your, your family is not going to be in a, in a struggling situation. That uninsured or underinsured motorist, we'll get to some in more detail. It's the most important thing. So I'd like to lead off with that, and I'll probably finish with it. There are a lot of accidents happening. And you wonder, um, how, how do all these accidents happen? You know, we've got cars that have more safety features than ever before. If I get within like 50 feet of a certain speed, my car starts beeping at me. Slow down, slow down. But how do they happen? How does the situation you described, where you're stopped at a stop sign or a stop light, and someone just plows into the back of you, how does that happen? Anyone have a guess? With the That's exactly right. It's on the cell phone. I even brought my prop, right? If you go down, what you see on the roads is they're like this, right? I, I drive over by the University of Florida. I see kids in school there. So their number one asset is their brain, their education, right? They're on scooters with no helmets like this, driving on a scooter. So that's what's happening and it's as dangerous, in my opinion, as drinking and driving. It's as dangerous as drinking and driving, if not more, because more people are doing it, and they're doing it more often. So we're just seeing a lot of accidents. So what I want to talk about is to what, what types of auto insurance is available and how will it protect you. The first thing, the, the theme of this is plan ahead. So, you know, I told you about uninsured motors, but we're actually going to start with one called gap insurance, Okay. Gap insurance is there, you know, who here has a car loan, owes money on their car? Yeah, that's pretty common, right? That, that, that's pretty normal. And sometimes it, people are in a situation where, you know, you got to go buy a car and you know you're overpaying for it, right? You know, whether it's a credit situation or you don't have enough for a down payment or whatever it is, you got to pay more for this car than you know it's worth. But I don't know if I'm still, but you know that, um, can you all still hear me okay? Okay you know that you can afford the monthly payment. Well, let's say the car is worth $10,000, but you paid $15,000 for it, okay? If what gap insurance will do is it will help pay that difference in what you owe and in what the car is worth. Because if someone smashes into your car and it's only worth $10,000, but you owe $15,000, their insurance is only required to pay you 10000 They don't have to give you the amount to pay off the loan. they got to give you the fair market value for the car. Understand? So this gap insurance, if you're offered it, if someone's saying, do you want gap insurance, or if you have a vehicle that you are paying on, that it, you're pay, what you owe is more than what it's worth, get this gap insurance. Because one of the worst things we ever have to tell folks is, yes, your car is smashed up and only a portion of your loan is going to be forgiven. And you still got to make the payments on the rest, and it's going to be really hard to get another vehicle because now you owe money, you don't have a car because it's been totaled. Uh, if you have that gap insurance, at least it'll clear out that loan so that you can then get another one. So gap insurance, very important, uh, especially if you have a loan and you owe more than the car is worth. Okay? Well, I'll repeat the question. The question is, what if the car's paid for? Is that the, you did a great job, and it, 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 I'll I'll repeat the question. The good question here is, what if the car is paid for already? What if you're driving a car that you don't have a loan on? That's a great question. You won't need gap insurance then, because what that gap insurance does is, if you have this much you owe, and it's this is what your car is worth, it's going to cover that gap in between. But if you, if you own the car outright and it's worth $10,000, could be the best car ever, right? The AC's cold, 
low miles, one owner, never been in an accident before, and you go, well, the car has to be worth more than $10,000. But if that's the fair market value, that's the most you can get. Right? Now, we can help sometimes try to push up that value. There's not a whole lot of negotiating you can do on the value of a car. What we have had some luck with Miss Annette and some of the folks that work with us is we can do some research and see sometimes, believe it or not, the insurance companies don't want to really pay you a fair amount. <laughs> They're not completely honest with what the cars are worth. <laughs> but we can hold their feet to the fire. We can use resources like Kelly Blue Book, Edmonds, Car Gurus. And we can see just because they say a car is selling for a certain amount, maybe we can see actually it's worth a little bit more and, and then submit that proof, okay? So that's a good question. You don't probably need gap insurance, though, if, if the car is owned outright. Or if you owe less. If the car is a t worth 10000 and you're able to put 5000 down and you only borrowed five, then you don't need gap insurance. Gap is going to help you if you got into a situation where you know you overpaid for a car. Good question, okay? We're going to switch to collision insurance. That's, I think that's our next slide here. Now, this is money to pay for damages caused by your vehicle or caused to your vehicle by someone else, okay? So um, let's say you get into a situation where you're driving around a vehicle that's worth $20,000, all right? Um, and let's say it's paid off for the purposes of this, so we don't worry about gap insurance. The minimum amount of property insurance, and we'll talk about that in a second, minimum amount of property insurance a person has to have is 10000 So if you're driving around a nice vehicle worth more than $10,000 and you don't have collision and either an uninsured motorist, like what happened to Pastor Thorpe, or an underinsured motorist who only has 10000 comes and smashes into you, if you don't have collision, you're going to be stuck with whatever property insurance they have. So you want to... Collision is a good product because if you've got a car that has a higher value, you're going you're gonna to want that in case your car is smashed into, especially if it's a person that doesn't have enough property insurance. Okay? So don't, you know, that's definitely one, if you have a car that has a little higher value, you don't want to um, not get, you definitely want to get collision insurance. We're talking about some of the, we're going to go through the different types of insurance, and then towards the end, what I want to do, massive changes occurred uh, in March of 2023 in the legislature. Um, I'm not going to get political, but I'll just say I think uh, someone who might be running for president was very interested in making the insurance companies very happy, <laughs> and big changes occurred. Uh, and we'll talk about what some of those changes are and how they uh, mostly negative, negatively affect people who are injured in auto accidents in Florida. We're going to go to property insurance. So the other side of collision is property insurance. This is money to pay for damages that your car causes, okay? So where collision, it, does, it doesn't matter if you caused it or the other side caused it. Property damage is what your car causes. So, you know, the minimum you have to have is 10000 I will say you may want to talk to whoever you get your insurance through to try to increase that amount to something more than 10000 because let's say... You know, recently, and this is a public case, so I can say it, I had an individual I, I represented who accidentally uh, smashed into three townhomes. That was not $10,000 of damages. That was $100,000 of damages. So if you can't pay that out of pocket, then your $10,000 is not going to just get you off the hook. The, any other insurances that might kick in are going to then come after you. So you want to make sure you have enough property damage to deal with whatever damage you may do. 10000 is the is the minimum, but there aren't many cars that are worth $10,000 today. I think I've read somewhere recently the average value of a, of a car in the United States is getting close to $40,000. So if you don't have, if you only have $10,000 of damages, a property damage, I hope you never cause an accident, but if you do, you may be underinsured, and then you could potentially have judgments against you and insurance companies coming after you. So you want to make sure you have enough there. All right, our next one, uninsured motorists. Have you ever heard anyone talk about this before? <laughs> this is the big one. I even used yellow highlighting because I wanted to in impress how important this is. So we have, last I checked, there's about 22% of people who are out there driving right now with no driver's license for a variety of reasons. Some folks, unfortunately, can't get a license because they owe you know, money for, for a variety of reasons. Some people in this state may not be here legally and can't go get a license, may just want to go to work but can't get a license. 
whatever the cause is, over 20% of people that you may be encountering out there don't have any insurance. And so, and the consequence is almost nothing. You know, I mean, you, you see, I, I'm, not an, I'm not advocating you have no insurance. That's going to be a big mistake. But maybe you get a civil ticket or something like that. So I think sometimes folks just scrimp on the insurance and don't pay what they, what they should do. If you get hit by a person who doesn't have insurance, you've got medical bills that may pile up. Now, the first $10,000 of your medical bills are going to be paid by your own insurance. That's no fault. You've probably heard of Florida no fault. That's what that means. So if you have valid insurance, you have something called PIP or personal injury protection. That pays for the first $10,000 of your own medical bills. But after that, what do you do? What do you do if you're out of work? Yeah, the average cost, and Net and I work on these together. Ms. Annette is one of our experts with looking at closing statements and the, and the, the bills. What is, a, what is an injection cost? $5,000 if you need a pain management injection? Surgery cost. Anyone have an idea what a, what, a, what a shoulder surgery might cost? That would be, you know, an amount that would be reasonable. Some t that's a good guess. That's a really good guess. They can go as much as $30,000 when you factor in the doctor's fees, the facility fee, the anesthesia. So your guess was good. But it may be, you know, plus the anesthesia, plus the hospital, plus the hardware. The aspirin, yeah, the aspirin. So, you know, $10,000 doesn't go too far. You know, so if you're in a situation where you get a fender bender and you need some, you know, some physical therapy or chiropractic care, yeah, yeah that will probably be enough to do it. But the second you need pain management because the inflammation won't go down or the second you need an MRI, or the second you start to feel, hey, it's been a couple months, my brain's a little foggy, and I'm not as sharp as I was. I'm struggling at work. I'm struggling at home. I'm struggling to find words. You know, the second you need to see a specialist who does brain, um, traumatic brain injury, I, I heard today, uh, just to get an evaluation done from traumatic brain injury is $5,000. You know, and so uninsured motorists, what that does if you are in an accident and the other person caused it and you find out that they have minimal insurance or they're one of the one, one in five people who are driving with no insurance, you know that you can get the treatment you need and you can go and get well, you can recover. If you have to miss work, you know that there'll be a pot of, of money to go after. Not at, you know, you're not wanting anything you don't deserve, but you know at least that you will be able to get full and fair recovery. Right? And so uninsured motors, and I'm going to show you some examples here in a few minutes of just how of, of a good value it is. Again, I don't sell insurance, and I don't say anything bad. I've got some good friends that do sell insurance. But I think the insurance companies don't always explain how good of a value it is. You know, oh, you don't need that. It's just, get, just get the minimums. You'll be good. Or if you want to, you can get a little bodily injury coverage. But they don't really promote this uninsured motors. They have to offer it. <laughs> They have to offer it if, if you have certain types of insurance. But I don't feel like they promote it. I don't feel like the people know, know what it is. The, the number one thing we hear, what is it? I have full coverage. Full coverage doesn't mean anything. Full coverage is a fiction. Full coverage is not something that you will find in any law in the state of Florida. If you Google Florida statute full coverage, you will get no results that are actual laws. You might get some blog that talks about full coverage or something, but it won't be real. There is no such thing as full coverage. That's why, you know, you need to make sure you have uninsured or underinsured. If you think you have it, if you, th you probably have it, if you might have it, if you're not sure, please get in touch with Miss Annette. Take one of my cards. Call my cell phone. My cell phone is on that card. If you call me and say, I saw you at Pastor Thorpe's presentation, I'd love to chat with you. And, you, and you say, I'd like to talk with you about whether or not I have this. I would do it, and I won't charge you a penny. I want to make sure people are, are taken care of if they get injured. I don't want anyone to be hit by an underinsured or, or an uninsured motorist and, uh, and not be able to get coverage. So we're going to go to the next slide, and I'm going to show you my insurance. Okay? I'm going to show you what, what insurance I have. So I use um, Florida Farm Bureau. That's my insurance. And I got a lot of insurance. I had half a million dollars of insurance. If I hit someone, 
or my wife hits someone, I, I don't want them to go, oh, personal injury lawyer, let me get them. You know, I want, I want to have lots of insurance, right? I also want to, you know what, this helps me sleep a little better at night. Again, I'm not selling you this, but it helps me sleep better at night because if I know if there's a major issue, if I get seriously injured, or if I, you know, if, if the Lord takes me home, I know that my wife will be able to go after some money that will take care of bills and provide for my family, my two eight-year-old boys and my wife, and, and that's what's important to me. So how much do I pay? For bodily injury, which is if I cause injury, I get for $210... Every six months, I get $500,000 of insurance. Now, Florida Farm would love it if I gave them that $208 and didn't, didn't uh, get any uninsured motorists. Because you see, I've got my property damage at $100, not $10. You know, you know what a, you know what a Lexus, uh, not a, what do they call the, the Tesla? You know what those, you see those electric cars? Those aren't $10,000. If I smash into a Tesla, it isn't going to be 10 it's going to be closer to 100. <laughs> I got 100 because I, I don't want that Tesla owner coming after me. Right? Uh, I've got some medical payment coverage so that if my bills go over 10000 I got another 5000 for coverage. And then I've got my personal injury protection, which you have to have an accidental death. You see that cost $18. Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to show you. 210 is bodily injury. Let's see. Uninsured motorist, $63. That's what? Six dollar, uh, ten dollars a month. So for ten dollars a month, I know that for if I get hurt by someone else's negligence and they don't have enough insurance, there's half a million dollars of uninsured motors that I can go after. Ten dollars a month. That that's that's a deal that's too good to be true. Why would you ever not get that? Unless you you know maybe as an insurance agency just weren't pushing it. <laughs> that that's all I can think of. Why would, you, why would everyone not have uninsured motors? Now, of course, knock on wood, I'm pretty good driving. Uh, you know, don't have a bad driving history. Your driving history may affect that. And that you know, knock on wood, no, no accidents on my thing. So, you know, that, those, those prices can go up, certainly, if you have a bad driving history, if you've caused accidents, that can be more. If you don't have uninsured motorists, you're really putting yourself and your family at a major risk. And that's why I started with it. That's why it's so important. That's why I showed this, this example. We can go on to the next slide, please. And I think this may... Oh, question. When you were talking about the uninsured motorists, that's $43. I mean, whatever that was. That's for what, a month? Six months. Six months. You got to be kidding, man. Six months. So why not, why an agent won't promote it? Why they won't tell you? Why, why they won't do it? I, I mean, I mean I'm not, I'm not going to say that all insurance agents won't promote it. I, I have a lot of friends who are insurance agents. I, I think the people you buy insurance from, if you don't go online, if you have a relationship with an agent, um, and there are a lot of good agents in town, I think they will promote it. But I think if you get online, if you're on Geico and you're saying, because look, we all have bills, right? Do, do I know that? Uh, my kids, my wife, and my in-laws have been at Disney World for a week. I got bills, okay? I, I don't even know what those bills are. I got, went for two days, and I had to come back to work. But I'm, I'm sure in, like, about a month, I'm going to have some bills, okay? So we, we all have bills. We're all looking, hey, where can we cut and save a dollar? And I think insurance agents might say, well, I can save you a little bit if you, don't, if you just go with the minimums here, you don't do this, and... They have to offer me that uninsured motorist at five hundred thousand because I pay the two hundred dollars for the uninsured for the bodily injury. Whatever amount of bodily injury you buy, because they want to sell you that, they have to offer you the same amount of uninsured motorist unless you sign a waiver. Right? So if you ever are getting an insurance agent or an insurance company that says, hey, just sign this uninsured motorist waiver, if you hear the word waiver, think Call Nick. <laughs> okay? Because you're going to say, should I sign this waiver? And I'm going to probably say, no, <laughs> don't sign the waiver. And that's just about true for everything. You know? But that's why. They, they have to offer you that UM protection. Yeah, look, if they, I think they realize that you're going to use the uninsured motorist less often than you're going to use the bodily injury. That's why it's, it, it costs less, right? They, they, they've figured this all out. They're counting all the... All the numbers, they, they, you know, these insurance companies are very sophisticated. I don't know why they don't push it. You know, I, I, if I was an agent, I would be pushing it to everyone. I never worked for an insurance company, so I don't know. But 
they, they, you should have uninsured motorist coverage, okay? And, and I put this example up because this is an example of a, a different one um, that's not mine, but I pulled this so that you could see an example. So we have the PIP and a bodily injury was $144. And if we go to the next slide for this one, please. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so bodily injury, 239 for $100,000, and then uninsured motorist for $25.50, $53. Now, what this person did, and I, I insure three cars, so sometimes the more cars you get, the better discount you get. If you're a good driver, you get a better discount. If you never cause an accident, you get a better discount. So this person, I don't know how many cars they had, but they have 100000 per person of bodily injury. That's if they cause an accident. But do you see how the uninsured motorist is less? You see how it's twenty-five fifty? That means that if they are injured by someone else, they're only getting twenty-five thousand dollars of insurance. This person had to sign a waiver. I don't know exactly, but I bet you that fifty-three dollars every six months wouldn't be more than seventy. I don't think it'd be more than ten, fifteen dollars to get a hundred thousand dollars of coverage. But some person, whether it was Geico.com or whatever, you know, Progressive, I, I'm a little salty with Progressive right now. <laughs> I, I, I joke. I like the insurance companies, you know. Um, our, tri our, our law firm had a good result against uh, uh, an insurance company called State Farm here recently. And then a couple weeks later, I took my kids to a baseball game, and it had State Farm all over the back. And I was like, yeah, look at that, you know. <laughs> like, I don't get a little piece of that, you know. Um, they signed a waiver to get that less amount. And I don't think they saved that much. So I put this as an example. You can see Uninsured motorist is always less. It's, the, it's a great value. I first heard this from a law, uh, my law partner, Dan Glassman, years ago about how good of a value this is. And he's right. It's a great value. And I don't know why people get talked into to waiving and taking less. I don't know why they don't get it at all. I just don't think it's emphasized the way I'm emphasizing it here. And so there's no reason. If you have insurance and you have bodily injury and you're in this room or you're on that screen, get uninsured motorist. That, that's a, a really important thing. Okay. Thank you. We can go to the next slide, please. So we're going to talk now about changes to the per, to personal injury law. Okay. Um, and those are up there, and I'm going to go through each and every one of these. So the legislature, on March 24th of 2023, passed this law. Um, it's called House Bill 837. This law was debated for about maybe three weeks. It was a special session. It was rammed through the Florida legislature. It was rammed through the Florida Senate, and the governor signed it. This law is a disaster for people in the state of Florida who are injured. It's a gift to the insurance companies. That's okay. We'll deal with it. You know, we're not gonna we're not gonna you know fold up camp and stop fighting for people who are injured. Our firm is gonna be here, and I think that's how uh, folks that are dedicated to helping injured people are gonna think. And part of it is making sure that you all know some of these changes. And so I, I welcome the opportunity to come and do that. Previously, the deadline to file a lawsuit, that's formally known as what's called the statute of limitations. It's just a deadline. It means you have to file the lawsuit within this amount of time. For years, that had been four years. So you knew that if you got into an, an accident and you needed a course of treatment, you didn't have to rush to file a lawsuit. You could do your treatment. You could reach what was called maximum medical improvement. You could see, is it just going to be some chiropractic care? Or am I going to need something like injections or pain management? pain management. Do I need to go get an MRI of my shoulder or my neck or my back or my brain? Do I need to go do an evaluation to see why I can't think clearly, why my brain is, my, my thinking is foggy? Do I need to go consult with a surgeon? Has anyone had an experience of how long it takes to get in to see a surgeon? Is it something you could like call up tomorrow and get an appointment? Months, months. You could go and do that treatment, get to maybe not what you were before the crash, but at least reach what doctors refer to as maximum medical improvement. You had time. You had time to do that. And then you could, in a thoughtful way, decide do you want to try to settle out of court or do you want to file a lawsuit? And that's what we help people you know, try to make that decision. Go through, figure out you know, 
be with them while they're doing their treatment, uh, understand the process, and then make a decision. Do you want to settle or do you want to go to court? That's what our firm does. Taking it from four years to two years, we're going to be able to handle that. You know, we're, we're, I kind of like to say we're small enough so that you can have my cell phone number, you can get a hold of me, but we're big enough that I can take on State Farm. Well, and I'm not, I'm not afraid to do it. But, you know, I think this is something important for people to remember that you've got to be on top of it. You know, it's not four years anymore. It's two years, and that is a big difference. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Um, I'm just wondering if, I'm, and I may be jumping the gun, you may cover it, but um, I was always under the impression that you have 14 days to go to the hospital uh, That's very good. after an accident. Has that changed, or is it, has that been correct? You, you ask an excellent question. So the question is, you have 14 days to, to start treatment. That is true. In the state of Florida, that's a very good question. That's a part of PIP. So under personal injury protection, one of the requirements is if you, you pay for the $10,000 of coverage as part of your insurance, you have to have that if you have valid insurance, minus deductibles, and, and they only pay a percentage, but $10,000 of coverage. You have to seek medical treatment within 14 days in order to get that benefit. If you don't get the benefit, if you don't go seek treatment, you could still bring a claim. There are some real hurdles with doing that because you're, you know, if you're hurt, and you wait for two weeks and don't get treatment, what is everyone going to say? You weren't hurt. You're hurt because of something else. You know, right. you were hurt because you went to the gym and power lifted too much, or you, know, you picked up your kids or whatever. And they're going to say, you weren't hurt from the accident, right? So you know, if you're hurt, and I want to just take a step back. I would never tell a person who's not hurt to get treatment. I am, that's not the law firm we are. If you're not hurt, you know, that, that, that's a blessing. If you're in a big accident and you're not hurt, that's a blessing. But on the, on the flip side of that, what I would say is if you are hurt, go get treatment quickly. Number one, so you have the benefit of PIP. That's an excellent question. Number two, it's so that um, you're not in a situation where an insurance company is saying, you're not hurt. You're not hurt. Now, a couple days is understandable, right? We, you know, when you're, uh, you know, I, I had a, one of the most terrifying moments, a terrifying phone call about six weeks ago. Uh, I was at work. It so Friday afternoon. I was about to go to a luncheon at the Bar Association, so I was looking forward to that. It was a nice, it was like, okay, it's a beautiful day. Uh, I have to go to this luncheon, and then after the luncheon, I can take my tie off, you know. So I was really looking forward to it, and I got a phone call, and it was my mother. And my mother um, had just taken her car to get it washed, and someone thought that at 1130 in the morning, it would be a good idea to try to cut across three lanes of Archer Road, they made it two, and then they smashed. They got smashed into it by a car, and then that car, uh, the car that was zipping across, got pushed into my mom. And you know, so you hear the the adrenaline pumping, and you hear her voice. It was scary. It was scary, you know. And it was, it was a good reminder for someone who's done this for close to twenty years, you know, that uh, how scary that moment is, you know, because I'm not usually there at the scene, you know. Um, you know, people can call me any time, and I do get phone calls from people who've been at the scene, but I'm not usually there. When I was there, it was scary, um, and, you know, you see that adrenaline spike, and some people react to that by saying, I'm fine, I'm just going to go home, and then, you know, the next day, life happens, and the next day, life happens, and they're in pain, and they're hurting. The problem, if you are hurt, and you don't go get treatment, then you give the insurance companies a gift where they can just say, hey, you weren't hurt. You, you waited, uh, you, know, uh, you know, 72 hours to get treatment. You, how, how hurt could you be? You know, we can deal with that. We certainly have had cases where there have been what we call delays in treatment, but the 14 days is a very good point. Yeah, very good point. What this is is um, a little different, though. If you do not bring your lawsuit or settle your case within two years, that's it. If you don't go get treatment within 14 days, you can still bring a claim. You just won't get your PIP benefits. So you lose out on that $10,000. So it's really important. And, uh, I, you know, I don't think it's going to be the most serious issue because I do think, that especially with firms that are like our size, you know, I call all my clients every two weeks. I know what's going on in the treatment. I know, you know, I try to catch little problems before they become big problems, right? And I know uh, my law partner, Dan Glassman, does the same thing. So... We stay on top of things, and I, we won't let statute of limitations run, but I do, I do foresee this being a potential problem. Okay? Attorney-client privilege. 
this is um, one, of the, one of the most sacred things in our law. There are certain privileges. There are certain people that you can speak to and you can speak to freely. Pastor Thorpe is a person like that. If you, know, if you all go and talk to Pastor Thorpe, you have a, cler- a clergy uh, privilege. You can talk with Pastor Thorpe about things that you've done, and you can ask, I'm sure, ask for forgiveness, and you can have a frank discussion with him. This is such an important relationship. Mental health counselors have this. If you want to go see a mental health counselor, you can talk to the counselor about things that have gone on in your life, and you know that that's a private conversation. Attorneys have that with people. There are times when you sit in an office and people tell you things that they have done in the past, and those are protected communications. Those are private communications. And my wife jokes around with me. She's found things out. And she, uh, she goes, did you know so-and-so? And I go, I can't talk about that. She goes, you do know something. I go, I can't talk about that. <laughs> there is a marital privilege between husband and wife, but I'm not talking about that. <laughs> um, that attorney-client privilege is very important. Now, you can't go to your lawyer and go, I'm going to go kill someone. That's not good. That's not But, you know, one of the things <laughs> we loved we loved being able to help people with was where do you go get treatment after a car accident? Any of you all ever had the experience of calling a primary care doctor after a car accident? I hope that you are never in a car accident. I really sincerely mean that. But if you ever are, and you call your primary care doctor, who you might really like, and you might really respect, and might be a wonderful doctor, they, 99% of the time, back me up if I'm, tell me if I'm wrong, will not see you. They will not see you. I think it's for a variety of reasons. I think billing um, PIP, personal injury protection, is a little bit more complicated and different than billing health insurance. And I think if I'm being brutally honest, I don't think doctors, your, your, your primary care doctors, want to get involved in the legal system. They don't want to have to produce records for, for lawyers. They don't want to have to come to court and testify. They don't want to have to give sworn depositions. They want to be doctors, and I respect that. So if you're injured and it's not an emergent situation where you're going to an emergency room or something like that, the person you would probably think to call would be your primary care doctor, right? So if you don't have that, where do you go? Where do you go? Emergency room? Do you want to go to the emergency room? I mean, for if you've got a little neck strain, if you, you know, a back strain, and you don't think it's emergency, where do you go? Well, urgent care. A lot of people call a lawyer, a lawyer they trust. Or someone that their friends have used or their, their family has used or their loved ones have used. And they say, where do you think I should go? And it's, it's not anything wrong or um, nefarious. It's just to try to help people because we have the experience. I can say, well, if you go to this doctor, this doctor will see you and bill you against your PIP and then won't need you to come out of pocket for the rest of it. Right? What the legislature wants to try to do is push people from going to doctors that will do work on what's called a letter of protection, which means they're not asking for money up front. They want to go and make you use your health insurance. Anyone here have health insurance? Anyone here have no out-of-pocket expense with the health insurance? There's no co-pays. There's no deductible. You, we got a couple. We got a couple with good health insurance, and I, uh, that is wonderful. My, my wife used to work at the state attorney's office. When she did, um, now she has a tougher job. She manages the house. <laughs> when she did, our, our health insurance, I think, was $40 a month with no deductibles and out-of-pockets. Then I had to go on the open market and buy it. It is much more expensive. And there are huge deductibles I have to pay before I get sent one from the insurance company. So, you know, what I say to people is, Do you want to use your savings? You know, you work hard, you put money aside, maybe so that you can take your family on a summer vacation, so you can have a nice Christmas, so you can give to the church, so you can do the things that bring you joy and happiness. Now, someone on their phone going 40 miles an hour rear ends you, and now they want you to go into your savings and go through your health insurance. Well, I mean, okay, I guess if you want to do that. But there are doctors out there who are willing to see you and give you excellent care, excellent treatment, and treatment that, that what they do is they treat people who are in auto accidents all day long. So they know, hey, this brain fogginess has gone on for more than a few months. Maybe we need to do something about this. This person is saying that their neck hurts, but it's really radiating into their shoulder. Maybe they need to go see someone for a shoulder. 
there are doctors out there that have this expertise. I used to be able to have those conversations with people and say, here are some doctors that I would trust on me, on my family, on my friends, on the people that I care about, because I care about my clients. Our, our, we, our, our, our motto for our firm is put clients first, and we mean that. We care about our clients. You know, I, I wake up in the middle of the night stressed out about cases, okay? <laughs> because um, I care about it, and I, I take it home with me, right, because it, it matters. And so it was always a blessing to be able to have those conversations and have those be protected conversations. The legislature has said, we want to know what you guys are talking about. And so the legislature has taken the attorney-client privilege as it relates to medical treatment and care and said, we are going to invade that. We now want to let insurance companies know what you're privately talking with your attorney about. I think that's wrong. I think there'll be challenges to it. Um, but, you know, uh, that is something that you need to know that you could potentially, if you are in an accident and you file a lawsuit, um, you could be, you know, asked by the insurance company and forced by a judge to say, what did your lawyer say to you? So you need to be thinking about that in, in those communications that you have with your lawyer. This is a big one, the next one. So when I went to law school, um, we had a class called TORTS. O-R-T-S, torts. No, uh, it, was, it was not tarts, the, the yummy things to eat. This torts, okay? And what it meant was civil law. You know, it was the, the law as it related to accidents, car accidents, slip and falls, civil law. And there's a history. It used to be if you were at fault even a little bit, years, this is hundreds of years, 100 years ago, if you were at fault even a little bit, no recovery at all. So someone could be 99% at fault, you were 1% at fault, you get no recovery. Over time, we realized that's not a fair system because if someone's 99% at fault and I'm 1% at fault, they, I should be able to get 99% recovery, right? That's, I think everyone would agree with that, that that's, that's right. So then we had something that has been around for decades called comparative fault. If I'm 60% at fault and you're 40% at fault, but my damages are a million dollars. I can get 40% of my damages recovered by going after you. Right? And you can see where this might be important. We live in a town with lots of pedestrian traffic. Right? If you're over by the university or downtown, you'll see lots of pedestrian traffic. And so you know, I've had lots of cases where, let's say, you're supposed to walk in the crosswalk. By the way, always cross at the crosswalk. <laughs> You know, because in the crosswalk, you don't have any fault. You take a couple steps away from the crosswalk. Now, as the pedestrian, you're at fault. But this happens a lot where, let's say, a pedestrian is crossing, and maybe the light just turned, their, their warning sign just came on where they, weren't, they shouldn't be going. But the car, thousands of pounds, has the last chance to, to not hit the pedestrian. But they're on their phone, not paying attention. So now you've got a person who's, who's walking outside the crosswalk, going against traffic or going against the light, but now this car is not paying attention, smashes in, let's say permanently injures the person to the point where they're never going to walk again. Okay? Millions of dollars of damages. Years ago, if there was an insurance policy, you know, for $500,000, the insurance companies would, not even years ago, before March 24th, the insurance company would look at that and go, well... You know, we're going we're gonna to give you this money because the damages are probably, let's say, $10 million. There's half a million dollars of insurance. Even if this guy, the pedestrian, is 60% at fault, his damages are such that it doesn't make sense to fight over this 500000 They would give that money. So then they, what, there was money to pay the medical bills, to give some care for the future. There was money, this person who was seriously injured by, you know, in, in, in part by his own fault but in a large part by this other person, now there's money to care for them. What the legislature did on March 24th is say, if you're 50.1% at fault, you get nothing. Nothing. And they didn't even make it like a super majority, 70% or 80% or 90%. They said, if you're 50.1%, you get nothing. What will that do? You know, um, I don't know. Because the, ultimately, the, determine, the person who will determine that, or the group of people who will determine that, will be jurors. You know, If a case actually gets to a jury trial, which very few cases get to, the jury will be asked, was the pedestrian at fault? Was the car at fault? If so, what percentage? 
And if the person who's bringing the lawsuit, that's called the plaintiff, that's who we represent. If that person is 50.1, not even 51, 50.1% at fault, they get nothing. And that's a big risk, right? That's a big risk. What I think is going to end up happening is insurance companies are going to know that. And in cases where there's a fight over who's at fault, they're going to try to get folks to take smaller settlement amounts because they know that the average cost to get a case to a trial in, in costs is thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. They're going to know that the they're going to be worried. Hey, if I'm found more than fifty percent at fault, I get nothing. That's a terrible change. That is a terrible change, and it was misguided. The I listened. <laughs> It was a painful couple of weeks. I was listening to Tallahassee. You can watch the legislature debate online. I don't know if you've ever, ever, ever done that. And I was listening to non-lawyers, mostly, debate this law. None of them knew any, any, what it meant. And their excuse was, well, people go into uh, stores, and they slip on things, and they fake injuries, and then they get recoveries. It is so hard to bring slip and fall cases. It is false. It's not true. It wasn't debated properly. And what this is going to do, I think mostly, is hurt folks who, probably pedestrians and people who have some, some degree of fault but have massive injuries, and now they're going to get fought on, on, uh, on things. And it's going to ultimately, I think, mean less money for their care and treatment going forward. It's a terrible, terrible law. All right, the next one. So is anyone here on Medicare or Medicaid? Okay. Um, I want one of my, my younger uh, p uh, participants. Any of my younger participants not on Medicare, not on Medicaid? Yeah, not on Medicare, not on Medicaid. You're working? Or you, you're, oh, I am working. You're working. So but you... Re okay. So you don't have health insurance or Medicaid, Medicare. Um, so you're, I'm just judging based on how young you look. You don't look like you're about to hit Medicare, Medicaid anytime soon, right? <laughs> well, you're not about to be retirement age. Let's put it that way. Okay. So if you get into an accident, now what the legislature lets the insurance defense firms do is say that whatever treatment you got was not reasonably priced because you, you should consider the Medicare rate in considering what the appropriate amount is. And that's true whether you are on Medicare, whether you are... I'm 46 years old. I, you know, God willing, I won't be on Medicare or Medicaid anytime soon. <laughs> um, uh, you know, with two eight-year-old boys, uh, you know, I don't think if you go to Disney for a week. I'm going to be working for a while. Um, and, and, and so, what the legislature has done is said, you know what, insurance defense firms, you can introduce what the Medicare rate is, even for someone who's not on Medicare, who's not about to go on Medicare. And what that's going to do is it's going to lower what um, juries think is a reasonable amount for the Medicare, for the, for the health care you need. So that's only in the case if I get into an accident? Correct. If you're in an accident, that's right. Okay, well then, my thing is, if that's only in the case that I get into an accident, why am I still being penalized for taxes for not getting into an accident and being safe? Yeah, if you, what, 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 that, what that law does, if you are in an accident, right, and you go get treatment, you don't have the benefit of Medicare or Medicaid. You, you know, you're not going to get those rates. You're going to have to go either, if you don't have health insurance, you're going to have to find a doctor who will accept your PIP, your, your personal injury protection insurance. And then if your injuries are beyond that and there's other insurance you can go after, you're going to have to find a doctor who will take what's called a letter of protection and give you treatment without asking for money up front unless you want to go spend your savings on treatment. <laughs> there you go. So, well, let's not do that. Let's not go there. But what it will say is this. As you get to a trial, what the legislature has said is that the, the insurance defense can introduce the Medicare rates even though you're not even close, anywhere close to sniffing Medicare. You don't have Medicare. You don't have Medicaid. But the insurance is allowed to, you know, you go in there and say, I had to go have a shoulder surgery. And it cost how much? 30000 30, but well, they can come in and go, well, you're, I know you're working, and I know you're healthy, and I know you're you know, not anywhere close to retirement. But the Medicare rate for that is 2000 So you get 2000 And they get to argue that now. Now, that is so, such backwards thinking, because what that's doing is it's saying, don't make this wrongdoer who was staring at their phone pay for that shoulder surgery. Don't, don't make the wrongdoer pay for it. Push it onto the health insurance company 
if you have health insurance. And what, what's going to happen when, when, they, when the health insurance companies pay more? Your rates are going to go up. Or send it to Medicare or Medicaid. Well, who pays for that? All of us. So their, their answer is don't make GEICO, who is collecting money every month, don't make Progressive, don't make State Farm pay it, don't make the wrongdoer who is on their phone pay for it, make this person suffer and go through Medicaid, Medicare, if they have it, if they don't, good luck to you, but you still, that's all we're going to give you. I'm hoping jurors, when we get to trials, will understand how ridiculous that is, that asking for this, what the Medicare, Medicaid rate has nothing to do with it, but the, the legislature in their two-week debate uh, with a bunch of folks that have never actually done this work thought it was good to include that. It's a terrible portion of this law, but we're, we'll keep fighting. The last thing that is allowed is um, there are cases that we've handled over the years for folks where there's been a criminal wrongdoer, okay? Uh, not, this isn't exactly auto, but it is a big change to personal injury, so I threw this in there. We, we uh, represented a, a young woman who um, was attacked in her home, in her apartment, because the apartment complex allowed uh, a person with no background check, with, no, with criminal history, uh, to gain, who wasn't even on the books, he was just kind of around doing some side labor for one of the managers to gain access to the keys to her home, and he came into the middle of the night. She was a strong woman. She fought. She fought. She fought him out. She scared the heck out of him, and she she got him out of there. But that was a terrifying. That was a terrifying moment for her. And he was a criminal who was convicted and sent uh, sent away. I mean, it's scary, and he got justice. When we brought an action against the apartment complex, we did it because not because they acted criminally, but because they were negligent. You allowed a person with no background check, with no qualifications, with no training, who had criminal history, who wasn't even on the books, to have access to master keys. And then this person was able to be so unsupervised, they took the keys, came to this uh, young woman's house and scared her and hurt her, the new change in law will let the insurance defense firms put the criminal wrongdoer on the verdict form. And now, of course you're mad at him. Of course he, he's wrong, but he's not negligent. That's an intentional act. He, he, cre he did something intentionally. It's not negligence. But the new law, because the insurance companies got their hand out, they got their, they got their gift, right? And... Um, now the criminal wrongdoer gets to go on the verdict form in a negligence case. It's a crazy law, and I hope that it, that portion is struck down because it's, it's just not, it's not right. So those are an overview of some of the changes. There were lots of things that happened uh, in, in a very short period of time without much debate, um, but those are some of the things. All right. I want to finish up with some, some thoughts of how to um, handle a car accident if you're in one. If you get a phone call like I got a, a month and a half ago from my mom, or if, that's, if you're in the situation that my mom was in, how do you handle it? Um, make a report to law enforcement from the scene. It is so tempting to not call the police, right? Every, the person who did it is going to say, oh, don't, don't call the police. <laughs> don't, don't call the police. Please, please, please don't call the police. I, I promise I'll take care of this. How many times have we heard that story? It's just not true. And, and even if it is true, you need that police report. You need that documentation of when it happened, where it happened. You want that. You want that witness. When the police officer comes out, they're going to see the damage. They're going to see you. And later on, if we need them, we can call them as a witness. So think about that. You want to call the witness. It's also the law. If you are involved in an auto accident that causes property damage, you have to remain either whether you were the one who caused it or not. You have to remain at the scene and you have to call law enforcement, okay? Uh, you've got to share that information. If law enforcement's not available, you can share uh, information with each other. But my thing to you is please stay at the scene and call law enforcement, okay? Take pictures of the scene if you can. You know, we all, uh, as distracting and as awful as these things can be, you know, this is more power, more computer power than I had, you know, in college. <laughs> and a big, big computer. These, these are powerful computers that take great pictures and take videos. Get a picture. Get a picture of the damage at the scene if you can. Now, I always give a little asterisk. 
I don't want anyone to be in a situation where you're going to be, your safety's at risk. So if you encounter a drunk driver or you encounter an aggressive person, don't worry about that. We'll get the pictures later. I don't want you to get into a situation where you're hurt. But, you know, uh, I got to see it firsthand at my mom's scene. Uh, I saw all the people kind of sneak the, the other car that wasn't at fault was sneaking around getting pictures. And I was like, good, you know, they're getting pictures, and I was getting pictures. So it was good. You got to get those pictures if you can. If injured, if injured, only if injured, seek medical treatment. I, I, again, I'm, I'm, our law firm is in no way ever going to lie, steal, steal, or cheat for anyone. That's not what we do. But we also, on the flip side, are not going to let people uh, not get the care they need and deserve to get full and fair recovery. So if you're injured, please go get some, some treatment. And remember, your PIP, your personal injury protection, will cover most of the first $10,000 of your treatment. Report your claim to the insurance company. Okay? Um, a lot of times what you need to do, people think, oh, I don't want to tell my insurance. If I tell my insurance, my rates are going to go up. I want everyone to hear this. If you were not at fault, your rates cannot go up for using your insurance. If you were not at fault, your rates cannot go up for, not using, your, for, for using your insurance. And they can't drop you either if you were not at fault. Now, I will give this little warning. If they find out other people who are licensed drivers are living at your home that you didn't tell them about, your rates are going to go up. If, um, you know, so you've got to be careful with that. But just because you were in an accident, your rates will not go up if you use it. So some people are very reluctant to, to call and make a report. A lot of times, I think I heard someone say urgent care. You will need, like for most urgent care, you'll need that, that, that claim number. So you do want to report it to your insurance, get that claim number, and then you can go get treatment. Okay? And then, of course, if you have any other questions, you know, after an accident, um, even from the scene, like I said, um, I have people call me all the time. You can, call our, you can call our office. You can call me personally. You'll have my cell phone tonight. Um, and I, I, I welcome those calls, and I like to help people. So if you're at the scene and you just want to know what to do, call me, um, and I'll be more than happy to chat with you. You're allowed to do that. Some people aren't sure if you can call uh, someone from the scene. You can certainly do that. Um, I do give this warning. Do not speak with adjusters from the other insurance company. <laughs> um, and let me give you an example of why I say that. Um, I say that because a couple years ago, we represented this really nice lady and this really nice family. They were on the interstate. And she, they were going 70 plus miles an hour. And a car smashed into the rear of them and caused their car to spin around. She had a child in the back of the car that was, I think, you know, six months old. And um, there's some moms in here. How does that, how does that, what, is, what emotion does that give you? She was in full-blown panic. Full-blown panic. Her brain was spinning. She was in full-blown panic. Um, when they talked to her from the insurance company a few hours later, and she had seen that her baby was okay, she was a deeply religious woman. And she just, all she could say is, I'm fine. I'm so grateful. We're all fine. The adrenaline was pumping so hard, she didn't realize that she had essentially torn a portion of her shoulder. Torn her shoulder. This isn't like a, my neck kind of hurts. Okay. She had a shoulder tear that needed surgery. Two years later, they throw this transcript at me. Well, she said she was fine. I guess she just tore her shoulder some other way. It wasn't the 70-mile-an-hour collision that spun her car around. That, that wasn't what caused this. And so I use that example as sort of an, uh, an extreme example. Just be careful. Don't, I, I would just recommend don't talk to the other insurance company. Your insurance company need to make a claim. If I would probably say don't talk about your injuries until you have a chance to talk with me or Dan. And so we can be there with you so that they can't trick you or have you say things that can be thrown back at you. But the other, your insurance company, you may have a contractual obligation to give a statement at some point. The other insurance company, you do not. So you do not have to talk with them, and that's why I say that. Um, if injured, seek medical treatment, and then focus on getting better. You know, um, one of the things I think that we, one of the real advantages that um, we can offer people is that we can take some of the stress off with dealing with the insurance companies, and we can let folks really just focus on their body and getting better and going to treatment and getting, you know, getting that, that full and fair recovery. 
think my time is just about up. I don't know if there are other questions uh, or, or not, but um, I really appreciate, uh, I appreciate you all. It was a nice, nice chatting with you. You might as well want to tell them about consultations. I will do that. Yes, good, good point. Um, I think um, just to hammer this point home, you call me on my cell phone to talk about uh, personal injury law or really anything, I'm not going to charge you anything for that. So some, I think one of the biggest hurdles with calling a lawyer is you think, oh, the clock started. I'm going to get a bill. You won't get a bill from me just to talk with me. I mean that. And if, if, if you've got a legal problem, I mean this sincerely, you think of our law firm as your law firm. We're, I promise. I promise. You call me, I'm not going to charge you anything for that, for that call. Uh, now, um, I do that because I, I enjoy talking with folks. If I can't handle the case, I'll tell you. I'll be honest. I'll say, look, this is not my area. I know a lot of lawyers in town. I've been here for 20 years, so I know a lot of lawyers, and I'll point you in the right direction. That first call, that first consultation, not going to cost you anything. So don't let, I don't want a lawyer's fees to rack up, be the reason you don't call. Thank you so much. Would you give Mr. Nick another rousing round of applause? This has been absolutely phenomenal. And again, I can tell you from personal experience, take the advice. Take the advice. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Thank all of you who uh, have joined us online, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Honored to have spent this time together with you. Let's pray. Look forward to seeing you this upcoming Sunday morning. Uh, it is Father's Day this upcoming Sunday. Looking forward to celebrating with you. Lord, we are grateful for all that you have done, all that you have impressed upon our hearts and our minds tonight. Uh, we pray for your supernatural wisdom that we would be able to follow instructions and to make ourselves better. Go with us. Go before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. See you all Sunday morning.